Hey, this is Healy Jones, VP of Financial Strategy here at Cruise Consulting. And I want to say thanks to our podcast sponsor, ARC. At Cruise, we've got a number of clients successfully using ARC to manage their deposits, payments, access financing, all in one place. One of the things that ARC provides that's really great is over a quarter of a million dollars in FDSC coverage. Their insurance program goes beyond the standard limit and it secures up to five and a quarter million dollars. So startups that have even more cash than that can go and access treasury solutions that provide yield and safety. If you're a startup looking for a secure financial solution that can help you scale, please check out our sponsor ARC at arc.tech. Welcome to Founders and Friends Podcast with Scott Orn at Cruise Consulting. And today my very special guest is David Bergeron of Reseed Partners. Welcome, David. Thanks for having me, Scott. This is, I think, our second or third time being on the podcast, which is very exciting. And uh, you you left a high bar the first time you were on it, where everyone thought you were incredibly funny and charming. And I actually had a hard time getting guests uh, for, for a week or so after that, because you, you set the bar too high. Um, but great to talk to you again. And, and the super cool thing is you're on to something new. So maybe just retrace your career a little bit and then tell us about the new project. Well, thanks for having me on again, Scott. Again, I think I, um, it's very, very kind and generous of you to, to describe the bar I set. Fortunately, I think I was like host, you know, or, or guest number five. So yeah, yeah. Know, there wasn't a, I think you're up to, you know, hundreds and hundreds of guests now. So I think, uh, uh, people have, have certainly you launched me. You got bar. me on that trajectory. You got yeah, going. Yeah. So you've been, you know, uh, reached much, much higher heights since. So, uh, but yeah, I think this is the third time I've been on with you, which has been wonderful. Obviously, you know, we have a history through uh, your days back in venture debt and working with my wife at her startup and supporting, you know, me and my days at T3. And I think that kind of brings me to a little bit of the the journey that we've been on to get here today, which is which is awesome and excited to share, you know, more about with you. Yeah. Um, so T3 was like a, how would you describe T3? And then the, how does the new, the new project Reseed fit in? Yeah, T3 was a pretty basic business from the perspective of it was all anchored in supporting the same ecosystem that you guys work in. So venture backed technology and life science companies, we wanted to be their outsourced real estate department for all the important decisions they had to make as their companies progressed. And we tried to do that in a very data driven way. We tried to be very deep and understanding the industries that each of our clients were in. So getting to understand, um, the people on the boards and the VCs, understanding the bankers and the accountants, understanding the attorneys, and really trying to pull those pieces together with the lens of real estate and office space, most notably, to help sort of promote the success and ultimate opportunities these companies had as it pertains to their people. And so, you know, the real estate uh, historically has been a big driver and advocate and supporter of finding and retaining great talent, which as, as most board members and VCs will tell you, is critical to the success of any high growth technology or life science company. And so we wanted to be an important player in that and, and someone that could really help scale these businesses on the people side and use real estate as the avenue to make that happen. You guys had a ton of data. You were like before your time on that too. I remember you had like these killer reports and I remember you told me like, I asked you for like some demographic, it might've been around accountants or engineers and you're like, oh, Salt Lake City, um, somewhere in Idaho, and three other metros are where you would want to locate an office. And I was like, and here's the data. And I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. Like, that's really cool. So, yeah, no, I, I think, I mean, there's a lot to that. And, and to your point, I think a lot of companies have done a great job of sort of aggregating and pulling those reports together in a really digestible way now. So, most companies have access to this. But 15, 20 years ago, when we were first getting started on some of these, some of these trends and trying to track some of these things, uh, a lot of that was relatively cutting edge. And I think it gave real advantage to our clients in terms of using that data to hopefully drive more informed decisions around why you should choose Salt Lake City versus Boise, Idaho versus yeah. Nashville, Tennessee. And I think that led to some great outcomes for those clients. Yeah. So then the new project is, I got the pitch last week, so that's why I wanted to have you on, but maybe tell <laughs> the audience what you're working on. Yeah, it's it's super exciting. So um, after spending you know, the bulk of my career in, in real estate brokerage and consulting, um, we'd sold that business to uh, a, a wonderful company based out of London called Savills. And we sold that company in the summer of 21, sold T3. And um, I spent the next 18 months at Savills, um, you know, helping us transition into a, a much larger organization. Savills is a publicly traded company, 
40,000 plus employees globally and been around for 160 plus years. So uh, very different than the T3 that, um, you know, that we developed that was much newer and, um, you know, much more uh, specifically focused. And so the marriage was great. You know, we got the scale and the opportunity to get more resources and the availability of, you know, some incredible people and partners we could work with. Um, I think they got um, a, a team of folks that had deep experience in a very niche focus that they didn't have as much experience, which was tech and life sciences. So I think that marriage, you know, made a lot of sense at the time. Um, but again, like like any you know entrepreneur or uh, you know someone that I think desires to continue to find ways to be impactful and change, um, I sort of you know about eighteen months in decided, okay, I want to go do something else, and I want to go back to building. And um, I think, you know, like a lot of folks that listen to your podcast or are part of your network, one of the things that's been so incredible about being, you know, part of this ecosystem is you just meet and interact with incredible humans. And I think one of the things that I thought about was who are those humans that I've met with and, and interacted with and, and had the opportunity to sort of witness kind of their superpowers in action? And which subset of those people do I think I could work well with and would like to work with and respect, not just as um, an amazing entrepreneur or investor, but respect as a person, as a friend, as a father, as a mother. I mean, you know, I think there's so many sides to these uh, partnerships and, and co-founding teams that you really want to be thoughtful about. Um, so I want to take a, a really holistic view and approach to finding the right people on the right team. And so I reached out to, um, the person who was essentially first on the list for me, a guy named Rhett Bennett. And Rhett was, comes from the allocator world. He was the chief investment officer of, you know, hedge funds and, and family offices and has a very different path than I did. Um, he's much, much smarter than I am, which is also key. You always got to find people that are, you know, can outpace you and in, in all the ways that you can't. And so I think that was really important. And, you know, I, I, I got to know Rhett through a common friend of ours who was actually his old roommate at Brown, a guy named Jesse Wood. Um, who Jesse and I worked together actually at some point as well. And uh, just again, developed a deep, deep level of respect for him. And so when I reached out and said, Hey, let's um, I'm thinking about doing something new. Um, I'd love to bounce some stuff off you and just have a conversation. And the timing just happened to work up really well. He was also had been um, thinking about doing something new, had this wonderful idea that ultimately became reseed. And as he started to sort of describe it to me and talk about the potential and sort of the purpose of the company, and I think the impact and the change it could have on communities and people and folks that don't come from exceptional wealth or a great background or, you know, hit the genetic lottery out of the gate, um, that they too can be really successful in real estate as a real estate investor. And so um, I think from a mission perspective, from a team and people perspective, and from a growth perspective for me, it was the perfect fit. And so yeah. um, I jumped on board and, um, you know, about plus or minus six months later, we sort of launched publicly with a founding team of five people and we've been off to the races ever since. That's so cool. Yeah. Cause when we were talking last week, it's like, if you, if you get into real estate, a lot of times you need money to buy your first property or you need to know people who can give you money to buy your first or first many properties. Um, and so there's like this kind of barrier there to, to being able to play in the ecosystem. And so yeah. it sounds like what you're doing is opening it up for a lot of people, which is really cool. Yeah, no, it's, it's a huge and very real hurdle, you know, that you can be, um, exceptionally capable, have all the right experiences, understand the financial side of, of real estate investing and have even wonderful connections and sort of deal flow. Um, but if you don't have capital, it becomes really hard and, like most, you know, entrepreneurs or founders in a variety of industries, people are happy to give you money once you have a track record. Yeah. And you can yeah. sort of say, oh, yeah, no, here are my last three deals and here's why yeah. it worked and here's why you should give me, you know, a bunch of money. Except how do you get those first two or three deals done? And that's the, you know, that's that gap that I think washes a lot of exceptionally capable and, and would be successful people out of the game too early. And we thought that was silly. That shouldn't happen. It doesn't need to happen. And there's a way to sort of build a better platform and model that enable those great people to sort of reach their capabilities. Yeah. And so maybe talk about how you're doing that. Cause it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty creative idea. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, we've tried to kind of take the best ofs, if you will, from a lot of businesses that we sort of witnessed and seen be successful before. And, you know, real estate is obviously not a new asset class. It's, you know, um, been around, you know, since the beginning of time as one of the original economy items. It's uh, continues to be the largest investment class, you know, in the world in terms of sort of available market. 
And what we sort of saw was we could take and learn from a combination of businesses. The first being, I think, Y Combinator, obviously, you know, something that you and I are very familiar with, exceptionally successful. Paul Graham and the crew did, you know, a wonderful job building, you know, a generational changing type of company that's produced, you know, some of the biggest, baddest tech companies around. And I think what we saw with that model was if you can build a community and, and a platform around both education and creating collaborative community and best practices and a, and a sense of sharing culture, you can start to really sort of change the outcome likelihood for some of these companies. And I think what, you know, as we, as we sort of further research what YC did really well, it was just that it was bringing people that had all the markers to be exceptional, yeah. but still needed support and needed, a, yeah. needed a, you know, needed a, a crew behind them to help enable and, and grease the skids and, and make the right connections and open the right doors and partner with the right co-founders to then build something that, um, you know, people didn't think was possible before. And so we've sort of taken a page out of the Y Combinator model. We've taken also a page out of, it's a, you know, Vista Equities has done a wonderful job of mm. finding ways to centralize a lot of the things that may not be as mission critical to top line revenue or building businesses. But if you can sort of pull and centralize and consolidate a lot of the components of businesses and then standardize those, use, you know, use scale to get better pricing, use, you know, the ability to, you know, uh, of a team that's doing it, you know, rinse and repeating over and over again, not to just similar to your guys' business. You guys are excellent at what you do because no, you have we, somebody we're the same that. way. We're totally yeah. the same way. It, it and works. Free, free those, up, those folks up to do the things that, that they're, that they're exceptional at and not the things that are sort of mundane and, and take up time from the things that really add value to the business. And so we sort of pulled the page from that side and then tried to apply this to, uh, you know, a, a world in which we think the, uh, the best returns are possible relative to real estate investing, which is not the big public REITs. Um, and, and really when you get to the private equity world, the standard private equity world, there's a lot of fees obviously that happen there, uh, some great returns there. But I think from, from our perspective, we found um, the most opportunity in the sub-institutional space. And so for us to sort of apply, you know, what we've described to the sub-institutional category, and for us, we define that as a five to 20 or $25 million um, type of asset, um, you know, across the country. And we're starting domestically. Uh, we, I, I, you know, we have plans eventually to go internationally and, and think this model, you know, has a, lot of, has a lot of legs to it over time. Hey there, this is the VP of Financial Strategy at Cruise, jumping in to thank our sponsor of this podcast, ARC, at Cruise, we have a number of clients who are successfully using Arc's fintech tools to store deposits, manage payments, get financing, earn yield, all in one place. But another thing that's important about Arc is that they have a heightened security and safety feature. Because they partner with globally recognized banks, they're able to offer an FDIC coverage over $250,000. In fact, they offer up to $5,250,000 in FDIC coverage. And if you have more cash than that, they have treasury solutions that can provide yield and safety for even more money. So if you're looking for a comprehensive financial solution that can help you scale, check out ARC. Go to arc.tech. Thanks again to our sponsor, ARC. So the, the mechanics are like you find the, the next um, super bright real estate investor and then you, you kind of coach them up. And are they submitting like funding requests to you or how, how do you kind of a syndication model right yeah so we what we did is we um after we sort of formulated the business model and and got the team to sort of like map out what we want to do and and the order of operations sort of get there um we then had one of our one of our partners and co-founders um who's critical to sort of what we built um a guy named moses kagan moses uh put out a tweet and this is, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of negative negativity and challenges with social media. This is one of the very positives and bright spots, I think, of, of, of the power and reach of social media. So Moses, uh, just a quick backstory on him. He spent, you know, almost a decade curating and leading the conversation on Twitter about what it takes to be a great real estate operator or real estate investor um, in a very public forum. And as a, as a very brilliant person himself and someone who comes from a family and a background of education, he just loves to share. And this became part of his ethos and, and talking about the good, the bad, the ugly, the really hard stuff, the simple things, the little things that people overlook. And I think like really started to develop a deep following and a real sense of empathy with a lot of folks out there um, around the way he thought about real estate investing. And so 
he sort of put this out there that, hey, if you've been following me or have ever wanted to work with me, like now's your chance. You know, here's this new company I'm launching called Reseed. And here's what we're going to be doing. We're accepting uh, applications for operators to work with us. So please put your information here, subscribe, and we can, you know, kind of process you through accordingly. And so um, great story there is we launched this thing on, on uh, I believe it was April 4th. And uh, that, that, that same morning, um, one of our teammates all of a sudden wakes up and, and, and in a bit of a panic, thinking that our website's being attacked. We're like, okay, there's like bots <laughs> attacking us tonight, and we need to put so a much traffic. on this. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just because it was like a brand new company and like we had no one go to our website before that. Yeah. And all of a sudden now like thousands were coming to it in a matter of hours. And so, um, you know, kind of one of those moments you'll never forget, you know, and I think there's always sort of those like little seminal, uh, you know, memories that you'll always keep when, when starting new businesses. That was certainly one of them. Um, but what that was is, is exactly as you described, people coming to us and, and wanting to participate. And it's participate both as potential operators and GPs in their local markets and as investors. And so we sort of, you know, had two landing pages. People could opt in for either and kind of through that whole thing had, you know, over the course of, uh, you know, a handful of weeks and months, we had thousands of people come on. Um, and fill out their information. We had hundreds, you know, seven or 800 ultimately like formally go through the application process with us to be um, operators on the Reseed platform. And we narrowed that down after um, an incredible amount of due diligence and um, underwriting, you know, exercises and case study evaluations and local market tours and meeting the whole ecosystem around these, these operators to pick what ultimately was eight groups. And so cohort one, which we formalized, um, you know, just in the last six weeks, uh, is made up of eight incredible, awesome. um, very capable, um, really, really interesting folks that we think have a ton of upside. It's super cool. You got like the investor interest too, because you, you are kind of like a two-sided That's right. you know, marketplace or something for lack of a better word. So getting that, that signal is pretty neat too. And so you trimmed it. What was the criteria for trimming it down to like those eight? Was it like their stories are unbelievable or they have a track record or just what, what would you look for? It's, it's a great question. And it's funny, we talked about how to go about this process once you have that kind of, kind of volume and not just volume, but like really incredible quality. Yeah. And what we had to do was essentially spin up our own scorecarding and process um, around what essentially was running a college admissions department. You know, yeah, for, I was thinking that actually. I and mean, that's, that's really yeah. what you're doing. You're taking all these incredible people that all you have, have worked hard and deserve to be there. And then now you need to narrow this list and send out a bunch of no's. You know, and I think our, our acceptance rate ended up being, you know, um, you know, just a, just over one percent, right? So it was a really, really high Hard, bar. Yeah, and there yeah. were, you know, incredible, incredible people that will be very successful, you know, and and we would have loved to have had a part of Reese Co or one, but you know, again, we wanted to stay um, kind of committed to our size and not, you know, overextend ourselves as a team. And so um, it, it was it was all the things that you would think about evaluating when it's you know background and experience, it's um, you know sort of what your strategy is and how you think about your market. It was um, coming up with how you thought about the type of product that you wanted to invest in and why there were either inherent and existing supply barriers to having other competition not spring up and, and you know, kind of dilute what you wanted to do along with, you know, being considered about this, the city and state you were in from a regulatory perspective and these things that you can't control but will ultimately impact your business. Um, so, you know, we really took like a very, um, um, kind of broad approach to evaluating the variables. We, we decided pretty early on that while there were a bunch of cities that made sense to be in over time, which we will be in, I think, as we have, you know, many, many cohorts after this. So I think ultimately went up in, in, in most markets, but we really thought and, and sort of put the priority of the, the person first, the entrepreneur, the GP, like that was a thing that we wanted to major in. And yeah. then we wanted to minor in the market. And That's so fair. we needed to be, we need to be in markets that made sense for us to be doing this, but we weren't going to let the tail wag the dog relative to that. It's, it's again, like any good business I've been around, or you've been around, it's all about the people. Yeah. And if you can get the yeah. right people in markets that, you know, have upside and, and, you know, capacity to do what we want to do in that market, you know, that's a home run fit for us, you know? And so, um, that's a little bit of kind of how we went about. Yeah, because their their local expertise is probably going to provide most of the the the, the alpha or the the value, That's right? Because right? it'll probably. I mean, how many deals can they do a year? Like a couple deals a year, or how, how yeah, many, how many I mean, I think 
it's it's hard to say. I mean, I think some of these folks will will prove us to be wrong in some of the, the assumptions around two or yeah. three deals a year. Yeah. Some will do, you know, some will end up doing seven, and they'll all be yeah. amazing deals. I'm like, man, like the floodgates have opened this market. This person has a crazy access to you know insights and availability and 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 deals that like all make sense in pencil. So if, yeah, keep them coming, keep, right? Keep so going, we hope, yeah. yeah, we hope for that to happen. Um, but you're right. I mean, I think that, you know, if, if you kind of think about it from a logical perspective, doing a couple, two or three deals a year, particularly to get started, I think is, a um, you know, we definitely view as a huge success right yeah. now. Do you have like, um, the borrow the Y Combinator analogy, like demo day, or how do you do this? That's one of the, that's, you know, the, the whole process builds up to demo day and it's a forcing yeah. function. Do you have, are you going to do something like that? Cause I would, I would love to go. I'd love to be yeah. like, Oh my gosh, the, the Raleigh Durham person. <laughs> what, what a great what a great two, uh, two buildings they just presented, you know, yeah. like, yeah. like it seems like there could be a lot of energy around that. I think you're absolutely right. And so we, um, we, I guess to answer the question, we had like a mini version of that. And I, and I'll, I'll sort of describe what that is. And then I think down the road, I could see this, you know, continue to iterate and change and be something and more like you described. But what we did is we had, we ended up having our launch week. And so after we, um, had selected all the, all the, um, operators, you know, um, finalized all the legal docs. We brought everyone together for um, an entire week. This was, you know, at, at late summer. And we all all, all flew into Boulder. Um, and we spent a bunch of time, you know, accomplishing a few things. One was just like getting to know each other, right? I yeah. mean, back to like, you know, so much of, of business and particularly real estate, it's so personal. And, you know, developing, you know, rapport and trust and understanding of, you know, strengths and weaknesses and, you know, um, you know, what gets person motivated and what, you know, brings, you know, consternation and fear and all these things, I think we're gonna be really important to have a great partnership. So we wanted to really develop that, 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 you know, that connection with the team and, and, and with the cohort members with each other, we thought that was gonna be really important too. So that was kind of number one. Number two was to talk about and make sure everyone understood really what we were looking for. And by we, I mean, reseeds investors are going to be looking for. And this is kind of, I can, I can mention this because I think this is, this is very important to our model. Um, we think about the world a little differently um, when it comes to real estate investing. Most traditional real estate private equity companies, which, you know, um, have, have done a great job of producing really big returns for a long time, are taking the bulk of their money from non-taxable investors, right? So endowments, endowments institutions, yeah. what have you. And when you're doing that, the return profile um, and the conversation around what makes a good investment becomes a very IRR focused type of conversation. And what what Moses has talked about for years and what Rhett's always subscribed to having run a big family office and what all of us want to, I think, believe that we can have in our own lives is this sense of long-term ownership. And if you look at the you know 50 wealthiest families in America, it's not by chance that they never sell real estate. Like they buy and they hold it forever. And, yeah. you know, and there's, you know, there's got to be something to that. Like if it was really fruitful and advantageous to be selling this stuff all the time, like you have to imagine they would, but they're not. And so I think kind of pulling a, uh, you know, page out of that book and saying, all right, how can we bring that type of approach yeah. and that type of, you know, investing sophistication to, you know, down to a bunch of other folks, you know, yeah. that, that don't, we aren't in the top 50, you know, wealthiest families, but man, I think there's a lot to that. And if we can offer the opportunity of long-term hold, very cash focused, we think about the world and we think about deals from an unlevered yield on cost perspective. So we, we want to eliminate the variables that can make this more challenging on the road in terms of, you know, the things we can't control or can't predict are going to be exactly what rents are in five years and exactly where interest, are, interest yeah. rates are in five yeah. years. Those are two things that like, we'd be in a very different business if we could be, if we could predict those two yeah. things. <clears throat> so trying to find ways to underwrite and make deals work in a way that don't rely on that to pencil and don't hope that appreciation hits or, and keep our fingers crossed that, you know, interest rates don't spike another 3% in five years. Like that's the way we wanted to build the business. And yeah, so we think that creates a lot of stability and a, and a great foundation to then buy an asset, make some improvements, do whatever we're going to do to it, restabilize it at, at, you know, whatever the, the, you know, the run rate would be month over month. And then just buy it for you know and own, yeah. buy it and hold it forever, and yeah. over time you can cash out, you can refi, you know you can again that's all non taxable income you know and so you combine that type of you know tax treatment with the um, you know all the depreciation schedules and benefits that come from owning real estate, um, it it just starts to become a really powerful tool as part of a an investment portfolio that 
you know, can really start to, I think, amass like generational type wealth over time. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I've worked my whole life because I was a middle class kid without a ton of money to just be able to own a house and and start building up real estate. So you're totally right. Like I I don't ever want to sell real estate. I'd rather just get it off to my daughter when I I pass away, you know? Yeah. That is the way to think about it. I think that's the right way to think about it, you know? So we're going to try and build that. Yeah, that's really cool. Well, this is awesome. You you built something cool. I love the Y Combinator analogy too, because I can really visualize that and count count me in for demo day when you get there. Nice, uh, nice. I love that. And uh, maybe just have everyone like give them the website and tell them how they can work with you or reach out. If, and maybe you're starting to already go for class number two. I don't know. Maybe you're starting to take out. Yeah, patients. yeah. No, that's that that. So all of the above. So um, you know, we're still we still are accepting applications for cohort number two. Um, we are targeting that to launch, you know, or, or kind of go start running that process the first half of next year. So we don't have a, a formal close date on that yet, but, um, there's a, again, a ton of great people, a lot of excitement, um, you know, and, and just, again, there's lots of learnings that we have from running through this now once, like we're going to be better and more efficient yeah. and, you know, and faster. And so I think there's a lot of good things that continue to happen, you know, kind of post first cohort, which we're excited about too. Um, the, uh, the website is just reseedpartners.com. And folks can go on there um, to check us out, uh, both as potential operators or if you're a GP and want to learn more and participate, we'd love to have, you know, go up, fill, you know, fill in your name and email and, and uh, we'll be sure to get back to you. And then also, I think the second side of this is, you know, we're going to be fundraising, you know, and we're going to be running a syndicate process for investors to participate in these deals that these GPs that I'm talking about are going to go identify in their local markets. And, you know, if having exposure to long term, you know, like hyper cash focused type of real estate uh, in that sub institutional category, which, again, historically has the best return profile in real estate. If that's of interest, folks, go on, fill out your name yeah. and email address. And, you know, that'll you know, we'll put put you in the system and, and, and make sure to reach out to you and, and have you as a part of our syndicate. And so I think to have the ability to offer this, you know, hopefully to folks. Um, you know, in a way that gives them exposure to this, which is, again, I think hard to build on your own. It's hard to oh, find God, local yeah. operators you in diverse markets yeah. doing some institutional that you have a rapport with and will actually take your money. I mean, so these yeah. are all, you know, barriers on both sides, both for Plus the it's like a quality and- review level with you and your partners above that, which I really like, you know, it's the Paul, the Paul Graham, Jessica Livingston thing, you know, that's right. That's right. Yeah. It's really, really good. Yeah. Yeah, every deal they underwrite is the operator, and then we also underwrite it. Yeah. And like it's yeah, got, yeah. you know, it's another another set of eyes to make sure, you know, we all the variables are spot on and we feel oh. really good about it. So, you know, I think what's, you know, our hope is it creates a ton of op- op- you know optionality for investors. And so if you imagine, if you fast forward five years from now and we've had, you know, we've had seven, eight, nine, ten 10 cohorts, and we've got, you know, 75 or 100 of these folks, you know, in market in a variety of locations all scouring for different asset classes. Right now we're starting this first cohort, it's all multifamily, but we'll eventually do things like industrial and medical office and self-storage. And you can imagine like us sort of having this entire platform and sort of world that gives people the opportunity to participate in a variety of assets and a variety of markets with a variety of operators. And I think that's yeah. um, something that doesn't exist today. It's a really good idea. I love it. Dave, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. And uh, take care and and give, your, give my best to your wife too. Tell her I said hi. I will. I yeah. will, Scott. It was great. Great seeing you. Great to connect. And uh, yeah, we'll chat soon again. All right, buddy. Take care. All right. Okay, bye-bye.